Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, November 28th, 2022. Coming up on the show today, from Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, editor Ken Schretzman. People were trained on eye wash stations because, you know, things could go wrong. You're working with toxic chemicals. I'm like, I'm an editor. I'm not. What do you mean? Eye wash station. (laughs) It's a different world. And editor Holly Klein. One of the things I love about stop motion, one day there was a call out for onion skins because they were making that scene in the birch forest and they were going to make all the leaves from onion skins. So they were like, if you're making dinner and you have onion skins, bring in your onion. It was just really, really random. The randomness of stop motion is what I love so much about it. Yes, all that and more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Well, hello there. Thank you for dropping by the old podcast. I always appreciate you being here. And as a little thank you for your patronage, I have a really cool interview for you. In fact, it's a first on the rough cut. Not the cool interview part. I think they're all cool. And, you know, I hope you do, too. No, for the first time, we are covering a stop motion animated feature. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. At least I'm pretty sure it's the first time we've done a stop motion film. My memory is just not that great. So I could be forgetting one. However, I do know we've covered a Guillermo del Toro movie before. We talked with editor Cam McLaughlin about Nightmare Alley. For Pinocchio, we are very fortunate to catch up with editors Ken Schretzman and Holly Klein. They had a pretty unique approach to how they collaborated on the film, and I think you'll learn a lot hearing them talk about it. Both of them have a background in animated features, but in different ways, which would make sense because they're different people. But rather than filling in all the details about them and their work, why don't I just get on with it so we can have them do that? And I will. After a few quick words from the folks who are so kind to sponsor this podcast, those musical geniuses at Extreme Music. Since 1997, they have been the ones that sophisticated storytellers have turned to for the best in production audio. Music created by the biggest and best names in the business. Trent Reznor, Mark Mothersbaugh, Michael Giacchino, Hans Zimmer, Quincy Jones. I could go on, but I won't. Rather, I will tell you how you get their music. All you got to do is go to ExtremeMusic.com and search their enormous catalog of tunes, formatted data like genre, tempo, instrumentation, lyrics, stuff like that. Or, actually I should say and, because you can do both. And you can just upload a track to Extreme Music, and they will use their seemingly unlimited powers to find you ones just like it. You can get your tracks in different links, you can get your tracks with different instrumentation, you can do it all right there on their website. And if you need a little help with the licensing, you can talk to a real nice person at an office near you. So the next time you have a big movie or TV show to make... Go make it with our friends and Rough Cut sponsor, Extreme Music. Okay, time to put into motion our little chat about stop motion. From Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, here are editors Ken Schretzman and Holly Klein. This is how editors start their day all the time. Where are the assistants when you need them? (laughs) Every Zoom call. Oh my gosh. The film we're talking about today is not Pinocchio, rather Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio which immediately sets the film apart and gives you an idea about the style and sensibilities that the film will have. I believe that neither of you have worked with him before that I can tell or with one another. So we should kick things off with how you each came to be on the film and the process for getting to know Guillermo. I had heard about this project and uh, I didn't know who to call or how to get on it, but just by coincidence, my A director I was working with on a previous Netflix film, The Willoughbys, Chris Pern, he connected me with the story people and I flew down to Portland and and interviewed and I was very excited. I thought this was, this sounded like the best project out there in animation. Well, I think you were right. And in terms of that interview process, that getting to know you process, what kind of discussions did you have with Guillermo? I didn't interview with him. I was, I, I, uh, I talked with Mark Gustafson, the co-director. We hit it off. He's a great guy. And uh, I just signed on. I didn't meet Guillermo until I, he came in and I showed him a cut. <laughs> that, was that awkward or was that, uh, was that just totally natural? That's a little, I don't know what to make of it. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was pretty natural. I was ready. He walked in and said, okay, it looks like a cutting room. Let's get going. Actually, I had heard that he likes that Walter Murch thing where you put little figures of people on the bottom of your monitor to make it feel like a big screen. So I did that for him when he walked in. He liked that. That's a veteran move. (laughs) All right, Holly, how about you? Um, Well, I have been in Portland for quite a while. I think this is my 15th year in Portland. 
And it's quite a unique time in Portland where, um, you know, I moved here to work at Leica and did a few films there. And then, you know, we had heard about these projects that were sort of getting started up. So it was going to be Pinocchio and Wendell and Wild. And then, you know, Leica had a few things going at once too. So I just sort of knew people around both projects, you know, was talking to them off and on for a little while about how things evolved on both projects. And then went in to talk to Mark and the co-producer, Melanie, about a position on Pinocchio. I think this was maybe a month or so before Ken started. They definitely had the idea that, you know, they were going to have an animatic editor approved by Netflix coming in. And then the idea was that that person was going to cut the animatic and then we were going to go into production, that that was going to be a locked, quote unquote, locked animatic. And then after that, production would start and I would be the production or the position I was interviewing for would be the production editor. So that was kind of the landscape they set early on. Uh, I also never didn't meet Guillermo until he came to town. I knew Mark peripherally from, you know, stop motion circles. We had lived in London then the same time that he was doing Fantastic Mr. Fox. I had met him, but we had never worked together or really known each other. And then I just said, sure, let's, let's see how it goes, see what develops. So signed on and met Ken. I think we had lunch uh, when Ken flew to town to meet Mark in person and then started working with Ken a few weeks later when he started cutting boards. So we've mentioned Portland a couple of times now. Why is Portland significant? I don't think I set the table in terms of where the film was being shot and put together. So tell me a little bit about why Portland is an important factor here. Well, I think Portland has become a stop motion hub of the United States at this point. And really the origin of that is from Travis Knight starting Leica, you know, um, previous to it being Leica, it was Will Vinton and Mark had a key role in Will Vinton Studios. So he was sort of a father of animation, of stop motion animation. So Portland has had a long, long history of stop motion animation. And then When Leica started making feature films and launched Coraline, I was part of a group of people that moved to Portland as sort of an influx of stop motion animation related talent. It's a really international crowd that's sort of settled in Portland to work around stop motion. And so it was a sort of logical place for other projects, Netflix projects and Shadow Machine to sort of take advantage of the talent in Portland. Well, I don't know how it's going to color the rest of my questions about Guillermo, knowing that he just sort of dropped by one day in the cutting room and said, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Guillermo and this is my movie. (laughs) But we'll just sort of roll with that. I did see a really cool video with him where he said that there are about 10 characters in literature that are universal, where even people that have not read the stories know of them. And he listed off, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula, Tarzan, Sherlock Holmes, quite a variety of characters. And then, of course, Pinocchio. So with most people already being aware of the story of Pinocchio, what did Guillermo or Mark say about what elements of Pinocchio he wanted to embrace and then where he wanted to depart and sort of put his own signature on it? Nobody wants that. <laughs> I'm not, no, well, I'm not sure if we had that discussion when we started, but it was, it was clear from the script that it was going to be very different and a little dark. There were elements of fascism and dark comedy and... Um, lost. It sounded like a Guillermo film. And I think, uh, you know, seeing a, a couple of, a, of his other movies, I kind of understood his sensibility and just assumed that's what we were going for. I mean, you're probably already aware of his work, but do you go back and watch his other films to sort of get an idea of his style? I did watch a few of the films that I hadn't seen. We had them all on hand as we went. So, you know, if we didn't watch them, before the film, Guillermo, when we would meet with him, had constant reference to, I won't just say his own films, but to the history of film. <laughs> so it was a lot of just pulling down films that he was passionate about, that he references visually a lot anyway. And in briefing animators, he would say, you know, the moment in this film when he's looking at him and this and this and this. And so we would dig up clips constantly throughout that. But yeah, I think Guillermo has such a distinct style as as well that, you know, there are repeating elements. And, you know, I think in this film, when there's a death character and there's an, you know, a afterlife chamber and, you know, these sort of mystical elements, you, that's when you feel the Guillermo 
miss the most. And so when that stuff is in a script and when we're developing that stuff, you kind of feel like, okay, well, this isn't your usual Pinocchio. No, it's not. And one of the things you're wondering is who is the film for? And the answer really is everybody. And it would seem that it's really challenging to balance that tone so that it does work for everyone. Ken, I don't know if you want to take that one, but I remember when you first started, we had a lot of discussions about how the film really starts in a flashback. Mm -hmm. You know, it really starts in a memory. Mm -hmm. And then the memory ends and then the narration, you know, you and McGregor starts narrating the film from the very start, but you don't meet that cricket character and you don't know who that is for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So time is sort of a nebulous thing in the beginning of the film, which is uh, an interesting way to open and an interesting thing to establish because, you know, you have the song and the memory and you end up getting invested in something that's really very, um, very much a backstory to the beginning of the film. And the beginning of the film is like, you know, when you feel like you win is saying, and that's where I come in. Then you realize who's been narrating the film thus far. So Ken and I had a lot of discussions the first couple of months about establishing who is who. Yeah, I was worried that uh, you would think that when you heard the narration that you would think it was Geppetto, but I think the, the voice is different enough and what he says separates it from the Geppetto story. But yeah, we were talking about the tone of it. And I, that was one of the first questions I asked Mark Gustafson, like, what is the tone? And he said, hmm, yeah, what is the tone? <laughs> because there's like a couple things going on. It's like there's all this somber stuff with Geppetto and the, the loss and this deep stuff. And at the same time, Pinocchio is like this slapstick, goofy character. And how will that ever work? And I wasn't sure until I put the reels together. And um, you can't just, I mean, I use music a lot to figure out what the tone is and where the shifts are. And you can't just shift music in the middle and shift tone back and forth. So you just go for the drama. And I found that the comedy just cut through. Hearing you both reference working with Mark and Guillermo, that's something I hadn't planned on talking about, but we probably should. And that is working with two different directors at the same time. What is the process like in terms of when and how you collaborate with each of them? Do they both come in together? Is it just who's available? How does that whole process work? Well, uh, when Guillermo's directing, he's dealing with a lot of departments. He spends a lot of time in art and, the, and giving animators direction. And also uh, with the story department, the, the people who are drawing the storyboards um, that we put together. Um, but, uh, but generally, I was in the trenches with Mark day to day, really working out the scenes like a live action editor would putting it together and, you know, reworking it and polishing it. And then when we felt we were ready, we, we would send Guillermo a cut and get general notes. And I found that, you know, we got a few notes, but they weren't, they weren't too heavy. They were pretty light notes and we just kept going. I know that you both have plenty of experience working on animated projects. I have over the years had a few occasions to cover animation in this podcast, but I don't recall ever doing stop motion before. And so I don't really know what kind of category to put stop motion in. Is it live action or is it animation or is it somewhere in between? How does the structure of a stop motion film compare to both animation and live action? I mean, you still have the story pitch, story reels, layout, animation phases that you would in a traditional animated film, or is it just really a hybrid of everything? It's mostly animation. It's a little bit of a hybrid because there are actual sets and and lighting and things that need to be built. But from my perspective, I started, uh, you know, with the storyboards and that's exactly how you beginning an, an animated film and use that for the blueprint for animation. So I feel like I spent um, a year cutting the story reels and, and building this blueprint, handing it over pr to production. And I feel like at that point, it's a little different than what I'm used to uh, from like CG animation. In CG, I feel like there's a lot of flexibility. You can shoot layout, cut that. There's all these stages you go through where you can still change things or you can call out a different angle. Really fluid. But I feel like in stop motion, when you hand over the story reels, now it's like they have one shot. <laughs> they got to get it right once. They only shoot it once. And I, I would like to hear from Holly about all the preparation that goes into before they actually go on the stage and shoot something. I guess I'm in the unique position of only having edited stop motion. 
<laughs> so I have a peripheral idea about what a CG, you know, what CG layout is and these kind of things. But the way people in stop motion describe it as is you, sh- it's like shooting live action really, really slowly. So you have actual physical sets and you have actual physical cameras. You have camera rigs and you have everything you have in a live action set miniaturized. And what's unique about that is that from the time we have storyboards, you have a film in storyboards and then a lot can happen. A lot can happen within each shot and a lot can happen which, within each sequence. So that was definitely my puzzle is that the editing of a stop motion production is everything from the live action reference. So, you know, every animator that's doing it shoots uh, him or herself acting out the scene, which I understand, you know, that happens in CG films as well. And you cut that into the reel, right? You would cut that into the reel. At the same time, the stage is working on their elements. So they're working on a camera move. If the shot has a camera move, they're working out the timing. So they will take that, let's say a, a shot is three seconds long. They'll take that. We give 10 frame handles on each side. Um, you know, hook the camera up to a rig and do a camera move. Then the camera move comes in as a first element. And I'd say, you know, three quarters of the time I'm retiming that. So I'm using the Avid to speed that up or slow that down. And then I'm putting a little animator in the corner of that, acting it out. And so I'm resizing things and just sort of using that screen as a layout itself of what they've shot and what they intend to shoot. And then that goes all the way through a block or a rehearsal where the animator doesn't shoot on twos, which is, you know, what a lot of our film twos and ones they'll shoot on like five so that they'll move the character every five frames while the camera is going through the shot, just to block out the shot as I imagine you would do with live action people. So that goes up to a rehearsal and then everybody decides that this is a promising looking thing for the final thing. And then they go for the shot. So while all these iterations are happening, these shots are coming in in a variety of sequences throughout the film. So throughout the day, you're sort of collecting iterations of very different things in each of these shots. So if you have 40 units on a film and this unit has a camera move and this person is shooting a live action element, you have constant things coming out and constant small puzzles to be figuring out while the sequence is coming together. So all of these iterations would be sent to Guillermo. Every day we would send him a package of uh, blocks, rehearsals, camera moves, and he would um, look at and approve or tweak every iteration of everything. And Mark is just there constantly running to sets all day, running back to the computer, because a lot of my job was remote through COVID, running back to the computer to see things in the cut, approving live action reference, helping animators shoot different live action references. So he's sort of hands on deck. Then we're sending Guillermo the package of things. And I'm sending each iteration of each shot in the cut with shots either side of it so that he can get a feel of how that camera move moves through three shots in succession. And a lot of times what you find is that the shot is not long enough, that Guillermo wants more, that the moment is longer. Because I think when you cut boards, you know, you have a drawn face looking at the camera, but it's very different to get that moment when you're actually shooting the puppet and what that moment is. The problems arise when you don't have any more track on your motion control rig of the actual camera going through there. You've actually, like a live action set, you've run out of set. So how do you get more frames without running out of set? So then you have to retime the whole thing, making the camera slower, making this happen, bumping that to another shot. So there's a lot of different kinds of editing as you kind of go through the stop motion process. And there's a lot of people on each of these sets that you need to constantly communicate with. Yeah, I think I heard you say 40 units. And I just want to be clear. So 40 units, that means actually 40 different little sets and crews. Is that what I'm interpreting? Is that there's actually 40 different things being shot at the same time, possibly? That is essentially what it is. Now, some some of the units will be bounce units. So, so an animator might have, you know, an inside of a dogfish unit over here and the outside of a puppet theater over here. And while that set is being prepared for the next shot, being set dressed, being lit, being the camera team over there, that person is animating over here because the animator's time is really, you know, the, the thing that everybody's uh, utilizing most. So the camera team 
and that sort of supporting set that goes, look, the assistant camera people, the camera people are working on one set. So I wouldn't say all 40 are going at the same time, but 40 are set up and are getting ready to shoot on any given day. So Ken, with this being your first stop motion project, compare and contrast with something like a Toy Story 3 or Cars, that phase, you know, as much as we can compare the two where like you're doing the storyboards, doing the animatic, how similar is it in terms of your role and the amount of time it takes? I know there's some variables in there, you know, every film is unique, Yeah. but comparing what you had to do on Pinocchio to something like Toy Story 3. I mean, I think what I'm used to is uh, a, a big difference was the development of the script. Uh, we, you know, in, in uh, CG animation, we're used to spending uh, like a couple years in storyboards, putting it up and, and rewriting it, doing iterations and really polishing it. I feel like this was more the, you know, like a live action approach where Guillermo had developed the script way before uh, we started. So we came, we came in with a solid script and we basically made that. So it was just a matter of putting up the storyboards, which still took a while. It took a year. But the storyboards are essentially the same. I could see handing our story reels off to computer animators and uh, going that route. But instead, we went you know, this route with the stop motion. So like my contribution to the story reels felt exactly like you know, all the other films I've done. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the handoff phase, if there ever really was one. You mentioned having lunch together. <laughs> what is that process of going from the animatic edit to production editing? What do you talk about? What literally gets handed over? How does that work? Well, let me just clarify about the lunch. The lunch was just before Ken started. So we had never met before. So it was like, we're going to be put <laughs> together. And, you know, it was a get to know you before Ken started. But once Ken started, we worked together closely. We actually, during, when I was cutting storyboards, Holly was on it too, cutting, cutting scenes too. So she was, she was cutting storyboards as well, you know, trying to keep up with production plans because we are told at a certain point what sets they wanted to build first. And they wanted those scenes locked first to know what they were getting into. Which wasn't necessarily a linear progression through the film. Yeah. It's all over the place. Yeah. But it wasn't, there was no formal handoff where... <laughs> You know, we had a ceremony or anything. Oh, that's too bad. I know that would have been fun. <laughs> I'm not sure what we did. <laughs> Actually, the handoff ha happened in the middle of the pandemic. It did, it didn't. Because it? Yeah. six months in, the pandemic hit. Yeah, so that's why we didn't have the ceremony. <laughs> we did end up having a backyard celebration, but definitely at a social distance. But when Ken, when Ken yeah, was, was headed back home. <laughs> but when I was there, some of the early shots started coming in. And I was dropping them in the reel. You know, you basically replace the storyboards with whatever the production shots are. And then it just keeps going. So I guess that process had started while I was on it. And then I handed it over to Holly. And were you both working from home the entire time? Not the first six months. We were... We were together in Portland. Yeah. And it was, it was different for me because I had never worked in stop motion and, you know, the environment is so different. It's a different world. Working in a warehouse full of artists, it's like Santa's workshop. People were at all these tables, you know, doing their woodworking and building props and sets. And there was a dogfish on someone's desk and a puppet here and there. It was very exciting to walk through. You don't see that in CG animation. Yeah, it's one of the things I love about stop motion. And, the, and there's, you know, sort of randomness, like there'll be a, one day there was a call out for onion skins because they were making that scene in the birch forest and they were going to make all the leaves from onion skins. So they were like, if you're making dinner and you have onion skins, bring in your onion. You know, it's just really, really random. <laughs> the randomness of stop motion is what I love so much about it. You That's know, right. the collection of items. And then I just, I just made a note, like we got all these, uh, you know, people were trained on eye wash stations because, you know, things could go wrong. You're working with toxic chemicals. I'm like, I'm an editor. I'm not, what, what do you mean? Eye wash station. <laughs> it's a different world. It does sound like a different world. Well, when I was watching the film, one of the things I started thinking about was frame rate and what frame rate was used to shoot it and the rules you use to animate the motion of these characters, because it felt like you wanted it to be real enough that the audience gets lost in the world, but not so real that it kind of loses the magic. I mean, almost almost like the difference between film and video or 24 frames per second versus high frame rates. Yeah. So what can you tell me about the aspect of frame rate to create just the right look for the audience? I think Guillermo wanted to embrace 
the handmadeness of it and and stop motion and stop motion could get a little so smooth that it starts looking like CG. It looks too good, and he wanted to take a step back from that. And he and he made the choice that that the the puppets would be animated every every other frame, so that just a slight jerkiness to it to remind you that they're it's stop motion. But I think the backgrounds, right? The camera moves backgrounds. I mean, that's all on ones because that would be. It's just easier to watch when it's that when it's smooth. Yes, when you do the camera moves, the camera moves have to be on ones. So if you have a stop motion character that's moving while the camera is coming through a set, the animator has to adjust to ones generally, because other than, otherwise you feel the jitter of the camera move against the character. So I think the general brief was that we were going to shoot it on twos. The other advantage of twos is that as a production, it's much faster. And the idea is that you want to just keep turning over sets and, you know, get through these shots as quickly as possible. But there definitely was a sort of embracing of stop motion. And, you know, there was never a thought like if we were doing this in CG, you know, everybody kind of knew that this was going to be a stop motion animation. I think what surprised me and surprised quite a lot of us on this project was the scope of the project itself seemed to get a lot bigger as we went. And that could have been, Guillermo could have known that and had that vision the entire time. But the level of visual effects that came in at the end was really extensive. And the visual effects company was in from the very start, but the development of water around the stop motion character. And, you know, generally when I've worked on other films, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's a constant negotiation about who's handling what as far as the stop motion elements and the visual effects. That seemed to be like, if we can do it, we're going to do it in the camera. That was definitely an idea that Guillermo and Mark Gustafson and Brian Hansen, the animation supervisor, all wanted. You know, like if we can do it on the set and Frank Passingham, who's the director of photography, everybody that works in stop motion knows Frank and Frank is a purist about stop motion. You know, he doesn't want you to have to add a light in CG later if it's possible. So the amount of iterations that Frank did on every set for a beam of light through this or a bomb pass or an explosion, I mean, we had probably, we didn't even import them into the Avid because it was just so much media. But we had uh, a hero pass, which is where the characters were sort of lit. And then there was probably half a dozen to a dozen other lighting passes that they would mix in. You know, I think everyone's idea was that if we were going to make as close to a stop motion animation all in as possible, and then the VFX kind of flourished as we went on, but tried to stay true to the form anyway. In doing my research on the film, I came across something called the Eight Commandments of the Animation Bible. I don't know if this is a new concept to you or familiar to you. Um, Suffice to say, we won't dig into all of them. (laughs) Okay. There are a couple I thought I would run by you and we could explore. The first being animate silence. That's that's rule number one, which is all about making sure to animate the characters in the act of listening, which on the surface seems pretty easy to do and maybe just don't do anything. Yeah. But tell me about how you interpret that rule and why it's important in editing a film like Pinocchio. I think the key thing is in animation to bring these characters to life is to remind yourself that they're thinking beings. And I'm thinking about that even when I'm cutting storyboards, like give them a moment to take it in, give them a moment to react before they say something. Obviously, it's really important in a dialogue scene, just because the character isn't talking, they should be thinking and continually being animated. I mean, that's the way I see it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think one of the things I learned most in listening to Guillermo through animator briefs and these sort of things is like, slow it down, take your time, have the characters look at each other, have them think, have the camera settle on their faces and have their eyes moving for a second. And I think, you know, when you work in animation, the temptation is to, to have things moving along, to move it, move it, move it. And I think if you don't invest in the time it takes between these things, then at the end, you're moving toward a conclusion that nobody has really seen coming because they don't know why those characters are motivated to do those things. So what was interesting for me was when Guillermo would give advice to the animators that he would give to the, like, 
to children that he would direct on set. So he would say, you know, I have the characters look in, like I have their eyes look in three places and give them time. And so the camera is seeing that this character is thinking and then is concluding something before it is motivated to do the next thing. And I think that's really, really hard on a production, especially an anim- a stop motion animated production, because seconds are money, you know, and to slow it down that much and to say, like, we need another 12 frames, we need another 20 frames, we need another where things are just <laughs> slowly happening and you feel the film is like growing and changing and like, Everyone's like, what? It's growing all the time. But what I really learned is like, if you invested in the front half, then the back half, you understand a lot more about what these characters are doing and why they're doing it. Mm. You're talking about silence. There's a lot of that in Pinocchio. I think that's what makes it different from a lot of animated films. We're always in a hurry you know, and everyone's talking. There's a lot of moments. And I mean, it grew a lot since I left it in storyboards is when Geppetto wakes up the next morning after a night of drinking. That scene is really long. There's no music. It's just him kind of stumbling. There's a lot of detail in the acting and uh, no dialogue. There's a few scenes like that. Yeah. What I like about it, too, is that you don't get the feeling in this film that you are revisiting plot lines. You know, like you're like, I have to catch up with these characters. I have to go back to this place and see what these people are doing. You know, it sort of progresses in a slow and quieter way so that at the end, you have caught up with everybody and you've kind of been with everybody the whole time. You haven't been in 10 different locations with groups of people doing different things. Yeah. And I also wonder if just the, the live action component of it being stop motion. I mean, the imagery is so rich and so much to just take in that I think you really can just sort of live with these sets, live with these images for longer and just really, there's so much to study. That's interesting. Yeah. I think it's also a a choice I mean, you touched on something that reminds me of like Guillermo's approach to the acting of the, the, you know, the puppets, the animators is like he always had a problem with like stay away from the pantomime that CG animation tends to do where they're overacting. And I think that's possibly influenced by him being a live action director. And in his head, he knows what he wants from an actor. And it's a lot more subtle. And I think you find a lot of subtlety in the animation in Pinocchio, a lot of details. And then he builds in mistakes. You know, a character could be reaching for a door and miss it the first time. There's this great moment where, where, where Geppetto's reaching behind him for the axe because he hears something in the attic. And it's in the close-up. And he reaches for it and he misses the first time. And then he grabs it. Like, you don't normally see that. A lot of times, too, what was interesting is he would brief the animator. And sometimes he would brief on that stuff. You know, he really had an agenda to have missteps to make it look like the characters were acting naturally, like people would act. The other thing that was interesting is like sometimes people got so into their live action reference, the animators that they were shooting, that that stuff would happen naturally. And we would have three different live action references. So we would brief the animator and we'd say like, here's the first one, here's the second one, here's the third one. Or we would do it. And something would happen really naturally to the person that would make it into the film that nobody expected. I'm thinking of that scene where uh, Geppetto is interacting with a balloon in the ruins of the of the carnival. And that was a live action reference that Charles was fighting with a balloon. Hmm. And you can't rehearse fighting with a balloon and you can't figure out what you're going to do before it. You know, you have to kind of get the shot and then just do it and see what happens. And it's interesting to see how the live action influenced the brief and the brief influenced the actual shot. Well, it should come as no surprise to either of you that the second rule in the animation Bible is animate mistakes. So I won't ask that question because I think you both just sort of illuminated perfectly why it's important to animate mistakes. Ken, as the animatic editor, I know you're doing everything you can to tell a story that works beautifully, even with the limited assets you have, namely the storyboards. Holly, on your side as the production editor, you already talked about having to do retiming of certain things. Are you also having to do things in the Avid, like fixing subtle mistakes in production, like the sets are not lining up exactly, or maybe using things like Animat and Fluid Morph to change performances? There is a lot that is shot on green screen. So there'll be passes of backgrounds because, you know, you don't have, you're dealing with an actual warehouse, so you don't have the space to put the background element as far away as you need it to be. So certain characters are shot on green screen. It's also a way that you... um, 
by time to have an act to have an animator on a set on green screen and be able to you know chug along with one character while the other character's on the set over here or when that puppet is in use so it was a lot of um avid effects all the time you know it's a it was a retime it was dropping out the green it was um you know adding this character in here or this piece of the set or this lighting pass and then this character with a different lighting pass so yeah um you know it's definitely by the end of these films the avid is really, really chugging because it's just so much media and it's just you know the the playback let alone you know reviewing everything online you know through a pandemic it's uh it was definitely the most technically challenging in all senses that i had at the same time you know there were there were moments where it was like while we were shooting the first two thirds of the film, there was a new idea about the storyboards to a scene in the, the last third. So there was a time when we were still boarding, we had an assistant storyboard on till the very end and we're still reboarding sequences. So it was literally like every kind of editing happening at one time <laughs> for a good portion. I wish to say we had like left the animatic portion behind, but, um, you know, I think the storyboards on this film becomes in a way an agreement between the people on the film. So when Mark would have a new idea or when Guillermo would have a new idea about a scene further down the line, uh, everybody wanted it boarded because when they saw it boarded, it was sort of a way that they could both agree that this was the way forward. And then the people on these sets have to see the boards. You know, you can't say, well, we're, we're it, it looks like this, but we're not actually doing that. We're doing this. So, you know, to have a, a board person on and just say like, oh, I see the angles changing. This is the angle. And then send that and say, is this what we're doing? Was kind of a constant way that we were in agreement about where we were going toward the end. So where does sound, specifically dialogue, factor into all of this? Is that incorporated into the animatic phases? Is it scratch audio in that phase and then a final ADR is done? How does that all work? Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Scratch. Well, the bottom line is you ha you cut it in the animatic and see how it plays, and you need the audio before you animate because you're going to be handing that over and they animate to the dialogue. That's the basics. But what was different about this film, it, it, when I think about dialogue, I went for it through a few phases. The first cut, they had, before I got on, they had done a, a table read in L.A. With, with some professional actors, not the ones that we use in the film, but some other actors. They read through the script top to bottom. They were all mic'd. My first cut was dipping into that dialogue. It was beautiful for me because it was one take of everything. So it made it quick and it helped me get my assembly up. And then when we started rewriting and reworking it, we needed to start recording scratch dialogue, you know, before we brought the actors in. And somehow me and Holly ended up <laughs> being a lot of the voices. <laughs> Holly was Pinocchio and I was Geppetto. <laughs> And Volpe a lot. <laughs> and we had assistant editors that were all different characters. We were making jokes that we would have like a, a touring stage performance at the end of this film where we would all go and. Uh, yeah, yeah. We call, <laughs> we call, we told Guillermo we're the editorial players. <laughs> nice. And he liked it. So anyway, then you end up replacing all that scratch dialogue with the dialogue from the actors and replacing all that. And then you finally lock it down. And that's what the animators animate to. Pinocchio himself is a noisy little character you know, being made of wood and all. <laughs> so just being himself and moving around, he makes noise. And I read that Pinocchio has about six different noises that he makes. Yeah. Is that something that you will spot during either editorial phase to help bring him to life? Because I would think those sounds factor into his performance and how well the scene works. Or is that something you just leave entirely to the sound team? I left it for the sound team in my reels. I just had like wood chimes all the time. I just did, and just kind of had wood knocking around, but I didn't know ultimately what it would sound like. And ultimately, yeah, I wasn't part of that. Were you, Holly, part of the spotting or anything? Would they talk about that? Yep, we had spotting sessions with uh, Scott, the sound designer. You know, I have to say, a lot of the we, you know, Ken had a library of wood sounds, gear sounds, you know, and different combinations of them. Like I'm thinking when he, when Pinocchio falls down the steps and he gets up, he's sort of like, he kind of is a creaky character when he first comes to life, you know? <laughs> and uh, Guillermo did really get committed to a lot of those ideas from the scratch that Ken put in. 
You know, he really did like feel like when we did the spotting session, he, I mean, Guillermo in general, his recall of, of, sound of visuals is like nothing I've ever seen before. But he knew from, you know, watching the animatic as much as he did, he remembered those sounds. And he said, well, what I liked about it is this and, you know, what I'd like to change. So it was a great jumping off point from, you know, where we were in the, in the animatic. I think it's what's so jarring is that I was probably on this film for over two years before we had the first sound spotting session. And then when you finally hear it getting replaced, it's just so bizarre because you've just been hearing this film. Like it just feels like a different film when you're new sounds to it. Yeah. I think everybody gets really committed to, you know, scratch dialogue to scratch sound effects. Yeah. And then something called uh, temp love where you get, Mm. you fall in love with the temp music and that story. I had to watch the music twice to just kind of clear, you know, cleanse my palate to listen to, to it fresh because we're so i mean we live with it for three years all the all the sounds so anytime and you know anytime one little adjustment gets made by somebody else it makes us jump out of our seats well before we move on from the dialogue entirely uh, you know earlier holly used the word nebulous to describe the film it takes place in italy and during the reign of mussolini and some of the characters speak with an italian accent and then some of them don't and mm-hmm. it just sort of it, it's kind of a strange I think it adds to the fantasy of it. Like it takes away from the grounded reality of, no, this is where in Italy during wartime. I know that Guillermo didn't talk to you much up front, but was there any discussion or any idea of why that approach was taken to not have all the characters have an Italian accent? Holly, did you hear? We had our own ideas. Did not hear any of that discussion. I think I talked about it with you. Was it a conscious choice? Yeah, I don't remember any discussions and I, I don't know. I always felt like, you know, at least the English accents instead of American just made it sound European. So at least you placed it on the right continent. But maybe maybe you're right, Matt. I mean, if it was all Italian accents, it could be a little distracting. Yeah, let's go with that. (laughs) Let's go with that. I also think, you know, I think David Bradley, who plays Geppetto, is just so amazing. You know, I think the texture of his voice. I know he and Guillermo had a previous relationship and I, I just think, you know, he's such a lovely guy from all of these sessions, you know, and I just think he has a warmth to his voice. So, you know, when, when you have somebody that's that good and you see that person as Geppetto, maybe the other characters around them sort of fill in and fall in line. Maybe. Well, that word you just used texture. I think that really says a lot about the film visually and sonically. There's a lot of texture to it. Holly, I was really fascinated in looking into your backstory to see that your career really started off as an actual animator. And I'm just curious, what led you to transition your career into editorial, you know, going from second assistant to assistant to now editor? Yeah, I started out um, digitally animating kids TV shows. And uh, I still have a spot, soft spot for kids TV. I love it. Um, But animation, you know, it's a it's a meticulous business. uh, And I, I, I don't think anyone that works in animated films isn't a meticulous person. And, uh, you know, I think it got to the point where when I started editing, it was just for me a more interesting challenge of the meticulous. You know, I think, like I was saying, that the sort of puzzle of these films and the puzzle that each scene and the puzzle of each shot and the fact that you are you have such a variety to your day and your week in figuring things out. But the basics of knowing frame rate and knowing, you know, when somebody says add six more frames, like you have an idea of what six more frames will add to that. I mean, at least for me, I knew I had a basis of time in relation to a character. But, um, you know, I started to love editing because and stop motion specifically, because first of all, I love the craft of it. And I also love the craft of editing, you know, it's sort of like a craft within a craft. And there's, it's, there's just like endless layers of it. There's endless layers of camera. There's endless layers of character. There's endless layers of sound. I mean, when you're not editing all the different elements of picture, you could just get into sound and sound effects. And then as these shots are growing and changing, shrinking, then you have temp music, you have to adjust, then you have sound effects, you have to adjust. So every cut really changes the game. And it's a sort of a, mind puzzle that I became more fascinated with than, than the animation mind puzzle. I thought I'd leave that to other mm. people that are much better at it than I was. 
Ken, on a similar note, your career began with you assisting in live action. But then when you transitioned to being an editor, you were doing animation predominantly. That's right. So what led you down the path of going into animation as opposed to continuing on in live action? It was really a fluke. I, you know, I got to the point in my career, I was an assistant for a long time, like 15 years. And like a lot of assistants, you want to move up to be an editor. And I found that like making that step was really hard for me. And I had cut some low budget things, but it was a struggle for me to get jobs. And I got a call from someone I had worked with. He was at Pixar. They were doing Monsters, Inc. Was never part of the plan to be in animation. But I'm like, I'm a fan. And I, and I went up there and learned and I fell in love with the process. I thought, wow, this is a whole different world. You get to build, you know, movies from scratch. And uh, yeah, that was the beginning of it. Did I answer your question? Where were we going with this? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just, you know, why? And sometimes it isn't an intentional thing. It's oh, just, why I made know, the change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was just coincidence. And and it, and uh, the amazing thing is, like, I went from the struggling would-be editor, and suddenly I was in the middle of one of the best studios in the world working on these great movies. Yeah, that led me on a, a really interesting path, and it, it's opened so many doors for me. And I've seen, like, how the animation industry has changed. You know, went from, like, one or two studios doing it to now every studio is doing it. Yeah. Well, something I found to be a surprise, a delightful surprise, was that in the credits, the animators are given the -the above-the-line treatment. You see their names before you even see the actors. Yeah, that was just a decision that came down um, from Guillermo that, you know, he feels like the animators are the actors. And he wanted to credit the animators, you know, as quickly as possible and as most important as he could feature them in the credits. Because I think he really reveres their work. You know, Guillermo knows animation. He understands the history of animation. And he feels like when he was working with those people, he was talking to the actors. So those are the people that are giving you the performance. And if you enjoy the performance of the film, he wanted to make sure that you saw those names immediately. Uh, You know, as we said at the beginning, Pinocchio is a character that pretty much everyone already knows about, even if they haven't read the actual story or seen any of the movies that have been made about Pinocchio. And so everyone knows that, you know, Pinocchio's nose grows when he tells a lie. After all of your collective years in the film business, what's the most common lie told in Hollywood or Portland? <laughs> Let's do lunch. Well, in your case, you did lunch. So I don't know. About that. <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> oh, you know what people always say to me, which isn't necessarily a lie, but a misconception is like, oh, you work in animation. That sounds fun. <laughs> well, it does. <laughs> and as much as, you know, every day is fun, but it's not all fun. Yeah. <laughs> and I know, you know, you see animation as whimsy That's true. and as, you know, lighthearted, but it's hard work. I, I always say, yeah, it's fun, but it's a lot of hard work, too. <laughs> it is no lie when I say that was a lot of fun. Thank you, Ken and Holly, for talking with us today about how you made all that magic on Pinocchio. Now, depending on when you hear this, Pinocchio will either be in select theaters or streaming on Netflix. Possibly both. Either way, make sure to check it out. And make sure to check out Avid.com for all the latest deals on not just Media Composer, but also Pro Tools. I love them both, and I think you will too. So make sure to check out that little link in the show notes that will take you to Avid's special offers page. Hey, while you're there, get me something too. I love gifts. And I love doing this podcast. It's the gift that keeps on giving. And feel free to re-gift it. It's easy to wrap, and it doesn't cost anything. And if you come back next week, I'll give you another one. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. The Rough Cut.